Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the webinar. Uh, Doing a deal pre-budget, what's practical now, is hosted by PM Corporate Finance. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, before we kick off uh, with the presentations, um, sort of a few housekeeping points to cover. Uh, the webinar will finish at 12 noon. We uh, will promise to try and keep to time. Um, the webinar um, will be recorded and we may um, so offer some um, a summary of the slides uh, post event. Um, there will be uh, a Q&A at the end of the presentations. Um, please uh, take a look at the, your toolbar in Zoom where you can submit questions um, to any of our presenters and I'll, I'll try and pick those up um, during the Q&A session. Um, in order to keep things interesting for you, uh, we will be uh, running a poll uh, during some of the presentations, so please take part um, as it will um, help generate some talking points and uh, as to where our audience will be um, on a particular issue. Um, so our first presentation today will be um, delivered by Ned Brown. Um, here's a look at the odds of getting a deal done before budget day, sometime in March. Um, we then be hearing from Philip Alaganju on steps to take in the sale process when your timescales are tight. Um, this will be followed by um, Yann Fasho will talk about um, pre-budget tax planning. And then to conclude, we're here from Lake Falconer on exit options. Um, what are the front runners if you want to do something now? Um, so Ned, um, it's over to you to get us underway. Thanks, Sean, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Ned, a manager at PM Group Finance. Uh, today, I'm going to quickly give you an overview of the M&A markets and the impact COVID has had on it. I'll then quickly run through valuations and then briefly touch on funding options in the current market and especially for the buy side. So this chart here uh, is from Mark to Market, which is an M&A database we subscribe to. It's an overview of uh, the last 12 months UK M&A activity and sort of deals per month. As you can see, November 19 through to March 20, there was over 300 deals uh, done per month, uh, peaking at 319, almost 400 deals in March 20. Then lockdown happened, and there's a sharp decline down to almost half March levels, so 170, 167. And then to where we are now, steadily increasing month for month up to sort of uh, 330 in October 20, which is pretty much uh, pre pandemic levels. And it shows there's so much activity in the market. And it's a good time to get on thinking about a transaction. Uh, this slide here is from PwC and it shows global deal volumes and deal values per sector uh, in the first half of 2020 compared to the first half of 2019. I think what's interesting to show here is that virtually all sectors have been hit by uh, this pandemic, whether that's in deal volume or deal value. Uh, perhaps quite interesting as well, some sectors have performed quite well. Uh, the telecom sector on the far right hand side, that red dot, uh, has actually seen an increase in uh, deal volume, uh, deal value, sorry. And um, the reason for that is that telecom companies quite often have sticky recurring income, which is a huge value driver, uh, which I'll come to talk about now in the valuation section. So valuations and COVID, can we still um, measure uh, companies the same way we're doing before, or is it just finger in the air time? We've always torn on what's gone on in the sector. Um, in short, yes, we can. Um, and what I'll talk about here is a, the market-based valuation approach, which is the base, uh, the valuation method that we use for valuable uh, profitable companies. Uh, and there's three main variable components within that. Uh, the first is profit. Um, and then the second is uh, multiples, and then your profit times your multiple gives you your enterprise value. And then the third variable component is the equity value adjustments. So in the next few slides, I'll be focusing on, focusing on the FTSE 100 and S&P 500. Uh, this is publicly available data, so it gives a good uh, data set. The first 
slide here, I'll be covering uh, profits. And here I'm talking about EBITDA, which is only for interest, tax, depreciation, depreciation and amortization. And really overall, uh, the last two years from December 18 through to December 20, we can see a decline in EBITDA growth uh, across all these uh, businesses here. And really um, the FTSE 100 is down almost 20%. So quite a large drop from 2018. So the slide here really is showing that you need to understand the wider context. If your business or your client businesses are doing just under performance or maybe flat, that's great. Uh, flat is the new good. And uh, we'll come on to why that is in a second. So we've now talked about our profit levels. We now need to talk about our multiples. Um, so again, we're talking about EV, which is enterprise value, divided by EBITDA, the profit metric, and this is over the last 12 months. Um, again, using the FTSE 100 and the S&P 500 EV, EBITDA multiples. I've also used the PCPI and the Argos index, and that's Argos not being the place where you used to get all those free pens. These are transactional indices, um, so SME indices, so quite relevant. So overall, it follows a similar trend uh, to the profit figure we saw before. However, post lockdown, uh, we've seen an increase in multiples really across all indices and particularly the S&P 500. And uh, the reason for that is that the S&P 500 actually has quite a large number of technology constituents, which typically trade at a higher multiple. I think my main point here is that it's all well and good looking at the academic side of valuation, your profit and uh, your multiples, but ultimately it's about price. Uh, these companies are worth X amounts, and if profits are down, multiples need to be higher. And uh, if the multiples are higher, it needs to get up to the price that they're worth. So my next slide is on equity value adjustments. And there's three key elements to equity value adjustments. Uh, there's your debt, which is subtracted from the enterprise value. There's your cash, which is added to your enterprise value. And there's sort of the working capital adjustment which may be added or subtracted, depending on the normalized level of working capital. And it's really, really important to understand these ahead of a transaction. Again, looking at the um, S&P 500 and the FTSE 100, I've then looked at the uh, debt to EBITDA ratio over the last 12 months. And really, uh, debt is up, debt, debt to EBITDA ratio is up, and that's really to fund the earnings shortfall that we saw in the previous slides. So to give you a real life example of why Analyzing your working capital cycle and your cash and debt levels is really important. We recently sold a business called MJOG, and MJOG is a healthcare SaaS business. And part of the attraction of MJOG was that it was sold to uh, sold products to CCGs on multi-year um, contracts, and the cash was paid up front. This then meant that there was large cash balances within MJOG, but also meant that there was large deferred revenues. Uh, deferred revenues are often treated as debt like items, so a deduction in enterprise value. We then negotiated actually that these deferred revenues should be treated as working capital. So we landed on 80% of deferred revenue being treated as working capital rather than debt. And ultimately, that meant that almost £2 million of extra money was paid to the vendors. So it's very much worthwhile hiring advisors and other stuff. So we talked about the three sort of components of valuations. I'm just going to look at the, the output here, the equity value. So again, looking at the FTSE 100 and the S&P 500, um, what we've done here, we've benchmarked um, of December 18 being 100, and uh, that's carried on to two years where we are now, December 20. So overall, really, uh, despite falling EBITDA and despite increased debt levels, um, the FTSE 100 has stayed pretty much where it is in terms of the valuation of the companies there. And actually, the S&P 500 has increased. And again, it comes around fundamentally the understanding of the business itself and the value drivers. So very quickly, I'm gonna summarize the key valuation takeaways. Profit, it's very key to analyze in detail. Quantify your COVID impacts. These may be addbacks and don't sell on the position you are today. Sell on growth because it's the future that the buyer is acquiring. Multiples. It's very important to benchmark your multiples, uh, but ultimately it's about price. So know your price of the business. And equity value, analyze and plan here is key. Um, are there things you can be doing now to put yourself in a better position ahead of a transaction and maximizing the cash of the table? And 
then just to round up, um, funding options. And um, I think the key here is to realize that this current pandemic um, hasn't given rise to a credit crunch. There's still lots of liquidity in the market and there's lots of people willing to lend. Uh, over here is a sort of a high level summary of a few of these options. Um, and I know the slides are getting circulated around later, so you can read those in your leisure. And now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Phil. Thanks, Ned. That was, um, that was really insightful and informative. Morning, everyone. Um, my name is Philip, and I will be discussing, if I can get my slides to work properly, um, accelerated m &A, uh, negotiated sell, what's that all about? Um, practical tips to getting a deal done quickly. Um, so you, you may have heard of the phrase accelerated m and um, and wondered, what, what does that mean? If, if you're not an advisor, of course, um, hopefully you've heard of that uh, before. So typically it's a transaction that needs to be completed due to time critical circumstances. And so what, what do I mean by transaction? Um, well, I mean, the sale or purchase of shares, business assets, or, or debt within a business. When does an AMA, accelerated MA process, become applicable? Usually when there are short term liquidity issues leading to potential financial distress for a company. And so, related circumstances include uh, negative trading, uh, pressure from trade creditors regarding payments, the loss of a major supplier or a major customer or major contract, um, stakeholder and managerial issues sometimes require an accelerated MA process. Um, a question we get asked often is, is how long? How long do these quick MA deals occur? Um, how, long, how long do they take? And typically it's anywhere between a few days um, to around 10 weeks. But fast and effective decision making is required really to get to get the deal done successfully. So negotiated deal, negotiated sell, what, what, what's that all about? Effectively, this is where advisors lead one-on-one -on -one negotiations with a single buyer, typically making an off-market approach. Negotiated was an alternative to a full auction where multiple buyers are approached in order to yield the most choice, introduce some competitive tension and, and maximize the eventual price paid for a business. However, a full auction can take time. Um, it can be costly in terms of advisor fees, as well as disruptive and distracting for, for you if you're trying to you know, run a business as well as get the sale over the line. On the flip side, there's no way of knowing whether an off-market approach will result in the best price for your, for, for your business. But one thing is for sure, negotiation support will help with all manner of things, with deal structuring, responding to buyer queries and eventual offers, clarifying what things mean, um, and negotiating better terms in, 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 simple, in simple terms. So what does one look like in real life? Um, so here, here's a quick case study. Uh, in 2018, we helped to sell medical device usability, small privately owned medical human factors business based around Cambridge to UL. A, a really big US-based multi-billion pound revenue safety Science. Yeah, so basically, there's, here's a picture of me with Richard and Sally. Richard and Sally owned MDU, Medical Device Usability, a small Cambridge-based business. And they were quite happily trading. They were thinking about selling, but it was sort of five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years down the line. And, and they received an off-market approach from UL, a multi-billion pound revenue um, US-based business who were um, quite aggressively buying and building um, uh, their business across, across the globe. And so Richard and Sally um, didn't really know what to do when the approach came and, 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 and we were engaged to, to help them sell the business. Um, and you know, we, we helped with regards to negotiating the value, to structuring the deal, to getting the deal to heads of agreement, acting as a liaison point, 
on due diligence and helping the lawyers with drafting the commercial aspects of, of a deal. Um, and, and, and it was a successful outcome for everybody around the table, really. So that, that, that was um, a good example of how negotiated support uh, can work. So top tips to getting a deal done quickly. Um, DIY deals take longer. So my advice would be get some advice. Um, get your house in order. Delegate efficiently and effectively to separate your operational responsibilities from the deal-related tasks. Information flow can really quickly become a bottleneck on deals. So take the time to get the right information right at the first time of asking. Nothing erodes buyer confidence like reverse engineering, putting up numbers and then going back later on and saying, oh, actually, can we tweak this? Can we tweak that? You lose them. You absolutely lose them. So make sure you get your information right at the first time of asking. And, and, and Ned touched upon this earlier in his excellent presentation. Um, know the valuation of the business. Know, know the price you're willing to do a deal at. And know when to say no. Because it's a negotiated sale in, in, in some instances, or it's um, an accelerated m &A in, in some instances. Obviously, today I've been talking about a trade sale. Um, Lake and, and, and my colleague Dan will come to talk about other, other, other types of transactions. But particularly with, with regards to a trade sale, um, you know, no, no, know the value of your business. And you're not really going to know if you're sharing this with a bloke or a lady in a pub and, and they tell you your business is worth 10 times just because they saw it in the FT. That's just misinformation and that's incorrect. Get some advice, understand the valuation drivers, understand you know, the, the pricing mechanisms and understand when it's time to say, to say no. So that's all it is for me. I'm gonna now hand over to my colleague, Jan, who's gonna start talking about tax. Thank you, Philip, and good morning, everyone. Um, just uh, those who don't already know me, I'm one of the tax partners of PEM. And for the last 20 years, I've been mainly advising on corporation tax and transactional tax. So today I'm going to cover three topics. Uh, first of all, the Office of Tax Simplification report on simplifying the capital gains tax regime. Clue is when you see simplification in tax, it, it usually follows with uh, tax rises. And uh, probably just give you an idea of what might appear in the next budget. Also, I will cover the different routes from a tax perspective of achieving an exit. Um, before the budget, and also, um, especially in relation to deferred consideration, making sure you secure capital gains tax rates and reliefs before the next budget. And it's quite clear that really with um, the last 12 months, the unprecedented levels of government borrowing is going to be um, likely going to mean that we're going to have tax rises and things are going to have to be repaid. And I think there's been a survey which I think was carried out by Canada Life and Four out of five advisors expect changes to capital gains tax at the next budget. And half of those expect the capital gains tax rate to be in line with those recommended by the OTS. Now, for those who are not familiar with the Office of Tax Simplification, it's part of the Treasury. And the tax director there is Bill Dodwell. He was previously the head of the tax policy group at Deloitte. And after that, he was president of the CIT. So he's very well respected. And actually, a lot of recommendations, I expect, will be you know, implemented maybe not all in the next budget, but certainly over the coming years. So in terms of, uh, before going on to the OTS report, it's probably useful to have a reminder of where we are. Capital gains tax was introduced in 1965. And as you can see, these are the rates that we've had over the last few years. It started with 30%. And then uh, between 1988 and 2008, it was in line with the income tax rates. And then more recently with the introduction of entrepreneurs relief, these are the rates uh, that the main rates of capital gains tax rates, uh, ignoring entrepreneurs' relief. Uh, over the years, we've had the annual exemption, which was introduced to um, uh, help with administrative reasons, uh, so to, to not have to report smaller gains, and also to deal with um, inflation. And also we had indexation allowance for a period of time. But throughout this period, we've always had some form of relief for business owners. We've had retirement relief. Uh, up to 1998, and those were typically for individuals which were up to 50 years old, uh, or sorry, over 50 years old, or, or had to to um, to sell a business because uh, due to ill health, uh, and that was around till 1998. And then we had a period of taper relief, 
where uh, if people held their asset for a period of time, uh, they would be able to, to pay tax at 10% on, on that gain. But everyone's very familiar with entrepreneurs relief. They started a million pounds, went up to 10 million pounds, and then at the budget on the 11th of March, 2020 was reduced to a million pounds. So that gives you a bit of an idea of uh, the history of capital gains tax, uh, which I'll hopefully will give you some context in terms of the OTS report. So really in terms of the OTS, um, there, there were 11 recommendations um, made on the 11th of November. I'm going to focus on three of those, uh, which are published on their websites. On the rates, uh, Bill Dodwell of the OTS said that if the government considers the priorities to simplify by reducing distortion to behavior, it should consider more closely aligning capital gains tax rates with income tax rates, which we saw uh, in the past. And on business relief, they, they also went on to say that the OTS considers a business asset disposal relief is mistargeted in its objectives if it's there to stimulate business investment and risk taking. The government should consider replacing business asset disposal relief with a relief more focused on retirement. And then they also mentioned that the government should abolish investors relief, which is the relief that's still available up to 10 million pounds and 10% tax that was introduced in 2016 and uh, is likely to have a very short lived ex ex existence. And the final recommendation uh, it was was for the government should consider removing capital gains on the gains uplift on death and instead provide that the recipient is treated as acquiring the asset at the historic base cost of the person who has died. So a lot of planning in the past has involved passing on the assets on death and that's probably gonna be more difficult to do. So really these are, are the backdrop that we have to deal with in, in the next few months uh, in terms of recommendations. So what can you do in terms of selling your business? These are the, the key areas that we look at. Selling your business, um, which I'm going to cover in a bit more detail, management buyouts and uh, company share buybacks. Lake will also cover um, management buyouts and uh, employee ownership trusts. So on a business sale, uh, of course, you have competing parties and uh, one of the biggest challenges from a tax perspective is, is it gonna be an asset sale or share sale? And at that point in time, it's very important to, to think about the tax position very early on. And also uh, as part of the, of the advice, uh, you, you should look at how the disposal proceeds are going to be made up and, and how they're going to be taxed, especially with the upcoming budget. And probably the best way to, to illustrate some of these points is by way of an example. So on, a, on an asset sale, quite conceivably, uh, a company could sell a, a, a business for a million pounds and it would have to suffer corporation tax of 19% on that, which is 190,000 uh, pounds. For example, if it's goodwill and it hasn't got base cost, and you'd have net proceeds of 810,000. And at that stage, uh, you still haven't been able to receive those proceeds and you have the budget coming up. So you might decide to wind up the company, but in a lot of cases, that's not possible because you might have another trade or other assets in that company. So there are things you can do. Possibly you might consider hiving down the trade into a new subsidiary, and there are various corporation tax reliefs available to exempt that uh, sale of shares in the new subsidiary. And sometimes you might have a number of shareholders and you might say, well, actually, some of those are, are ready for an exit. So we could maybe do a share buyback and they would be able to effectively achieve an effective tax rate of 10% rather than 50% that we have on screen. So there's, there's always plenty of things that you can do on an asset sale. That's the key message from this. And also there might be situations where the, the buyer might request that, that some of the assets are extracted. Again, those things can be managed carefully prior to a sale. But ideally, what we want to have is a share sale because that automatically means a capital disposal very quickly and then effectively up to a million pounds, you have a 10% rate of capital gains tax and you get net proceeds of 900,000 pounds. And any amount above that, then you would be subject to capital gains tax of 20%. Now, Lake will cover MBOs, but I wanted to add a few comments from a tax perspective. Uh, there's been an increased scrutiny by HMRC since the beginning of this year. Uh, they moved their um, clearance team from uh, London to Birmingham, and unfortunately, a lot of inspectors um, are new in the, in the clearance team and, and they are scrutinizing transactions very carefully. And I think the key thing that HMRC are looking at is should you be getting capital treatment? Because what we have on screen is a diagram where the company has been sold to Newco, and if all those shareholders were shareholders in the original company and there hasn't been any changes, then the HMRC is saying, well, you've effectively disposed of the shares to try and get a capital disposal, but actually it hasn't changed. So it should be treated as a income 
disposal and uh, uh, any proceeds you will receive will be subject to income tax. Ideally to get a deal done quickly, if you look at all the original shareholders um, and you want to have a fundamental change of ownership to take you out of the rules, then ideally post MBO, you want to have uh, no more than 25% of the vendors. But we often have situations where the management team are already, already have shares. And as long as we have a significant reduction in shareholding, then HMRC will be happy as long as we explain precisely what is going on in terms of the, the commercial rationale for handing over the reins. The other thing that uh, is, is also looked at very carefully is capital gains tax deferral and uh, typically uh, in deferral into shares and loan notes and those have to be managed carefully uh, following an MBO which I'll go into a bit more detail. But I think it's, it's one of those things that uh, over the recent couple of months we've been uh, providing a lot more information to HMRC to, to speed up the transaction process. Now sometimes a deal may not be possible and we might be able to look at doing a company share buyback. Sometimes, unfortunately, uh, we have a number of shareholders and they've got different priorities. It is possible to, to do a share buyback, but it's a very rigid, rigid, uh, rigid mechanism. Uh, people have to hold their shares for five years. They have to substantially reduce those, typically to about 5%. And there has to be a compelling business case. And you have to look at distributable reserves. And one of the things that we've recently found out is, is the funding of the purchase. The company might have the cash, but it might want to retain that cash in the business. But it's an option there available to people. And sometimes we also look at doing share buybacks as part of wider transactions as well. But there is plenty of things to think about from an implementation point of view. But I think the key thing is, is we're, we're here to talk about transactions and, and a lot of transactions uh, will have an element of, of um, non-cash payments. And these might uh, form uh, earnouts. These are future rights to receive a, a, an amount which is yet to be ascertained. And it's really important to, to think about that amount and uh, effectively it's, it's brought in uh, at completion uh, for tax purposes and uh, to, 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 um, to obtain business asset disposal relief and capital gains tax rate is, is useful to, to be optimistic, but it has to be supported by a formal valuation uh, to, to, uh, to make sure those figures are going to be satisfied by HMRC. And, um, in terms of share sales and loan notes, again, those are deferred until such a point in the future. And the danger is that uh, when they are being realized, then you might suffer capital gains tax rates or increased capital gains tax rates or, or different types of reliefs. So in these situations, you might want to think about doing elections. And one of the things that um, what happened in on the 11th of March 2020 is that HMRC uh, and the government were expecting elections to be made by the 11th of March 2020. Now most of these elections are done on a return and as you can imagine for the 1920 tax year the return hadn't yet been issued. So a lot of people had transaction from 6th of April 2019 to 11th of March but hadn't made the elections and were under the new business asset disposal relief. So in these situations if you're coming up to, a, uh, to the next budget then think about doing freestanding claims or possibly to, to look at uh, structuring the deal differently by having a, uh, a, a cash deferred cash element or, or simple debt instead to, to bring the, the tax up front. But you need to make sure you've got sufficient amount of repayments to cover the tax on 31st of January 2022. So in terms of, uh, I've got plenty of things I could cover today, um, but I think probably the key thing today is really to, to bear in mind those capital gains tax suggestions in the Office of Tax Simplification reports. And uh, I'm expecting to, to see some changes, certainly in the next budget, but some of these measures will come over the next coming years. Think about the possible exit routes from a tax perspective, and also making sure that you look at the consideration to, to make sure you secure your capital gains tax rates. I think the reason I've got a picture on there is, is I will leave you with a quote uh, from Jean-Baptiste Colbert, which was, the, was Louis XIV's finance minister, who famously said that the art of taxation is so plucking the goose as to obtain the largest possible amount of feathers with the smallest amount of hiss, hissing. So I think, you know, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, um, business owners have been targeted over the last few years with living taxation and entrepreneurs relief. So it's probably best to get a deal done much sooner. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Um, almost exactly at this time of year in 2007, I first met Chris Wilkinson and, and Jim Ayer. 
Um, their architecture practice, Wilkinson Air, is perhaps best known for the Millennium Bridge up in Newcastle, hence the, uh, the picture, uh, for which they won the Sterling Prize. Now, why is this relevant? Well, because at that time we were faced with a tax cliffhanger, uh, rather like we are today. At that point, it was the imminent abolition of taper relief, which Jan mentioned, which at that time meant some folks could get a capital gains tax rate as low as 10%. Uh, sounds familiar. So very similar to the issue we're facing right now. And Chris and Jim wanted to realise some of the value of their business uh, to achieve succession and to lock in the next generation of directors. So we took a succession buyout approach and we were able to structure it, clear it for tax, raise millions of pounds from HSBC and complete it in about two and a bit months from when we got the green light in mid-January. So there's a few parallels here. The first is the tax cliffhanger. And the second is that it's definitely possible to do deals in the remaining time. I do have another parallel, but I'm gonna uh, leave that with you when I get to the end of this talk. Um, I'm going to... Um, no. I'm going to talk through what I think are the front runners in terms of getting deals done at short notice, buyouts and employee ownership trusts, and then share some practical tips to get uh, the deal done speedily. Now, as you probably all know, because you've seen most of my slides already, uh, I'm now going to do a quick fire poll, uh, which Sean's going to mastermind for us. I promise not to challenge the results later on. So two questions for you. Uh, firstly, our you or if you're an intermediary, any of your clients thinking of doing a deal before the budget. And the second one, looking at the broader economy, what kind of deals do you expect to see more of? So we're just going to put this up for 30 seconds max, just to take a quick test of the temperature. Right, we have the results. Interestingly, quite a lot, two thirds of people thinking of doing a deal before the budget. That's interesting. I thought there'd be a majority, uh, but that's a decisive majority. And also interesting down at the bottom that we see a lot of private equity deals, which I guess is reflected um, by Ned's point about the market, that there's a lot of liquidity out there, lots of people looking to do deals. Well, that's very encouraging. Hopefully uh, everyone's gonna be busy uh, over the coming quarter. So first off then, just to talk about management buyouts in this context. And, I'm talking about succession buyouts here, given the time scale. So vendor initiated where the business owner sells to his or her team. And if you have a stable or profitable growing business, it's very much a viable option. The basic structure is probably familiar. This isn't intended to be a detailed coverage. 100% of the company is sold to a new shelf company for a fair price. If you do it properly, you should get capital tax treatment, which is 10 or 20% for now. Um, funded by the cash in the company, by debt, by vendor loan note, and perhaps private equity, quite likely given the chart we saw before. And the management team invests um, some cash in order to make sure that they're properly committed. So what about the practicality of doing these uh, to this time scale? Well, I think you need to focus on the critical steps. External funding is one of them. It can be done to time scale, but you need to get your skates on. And it's probably quicker if it's 100% vendor funded with the thought of refinancing it later if that's possible for tax. The other key uh, point is the tax clearance. Uh, Ned, Phil and myself work really closely with Jan and his team in these things. And right now, above all, the key thing is to get them through first time. As Jan says, there are issues with the revenue at the moment. And as you probably all know, they have 28 days to reply. And if they ask a question on day 28, that resets the clock for another 28 days. We don't have time for that now. So you need to be working with folks who are pretty sure of getting the clearance through first time around. So that's buyouts. What about um, employee ownership deals? Well, John Lewis is very much the poster boy for employee ownership. In fact, its structure predates the employee ownership trust legislation by a long way. If you are thinking of doing uh, an EOT deal, you need to sell at least half of the company to the trust. It's very efficient for the vendors who pay no tax at all. Um, and the aim is very much to go for long-term employee ownership. You're intended to be John Lewis forever, basically. And that's because there's a very unfavorable tax treatment on a subsequent exit. Funding is pretty similar. 
to a buyout, but a bit less flexible. It's quite difficult probably to get private equity money in because there's no easy exit from these deals. Employees, of course, are entitled to up to 3,600 of tax-free bonus. The key conditions are the trust must benefit all eligible employees on the same terms, and the target must be a trading company. And I think you need to reflect on the cultural suitability of the business. It may need a different culture if it's going to become genuinely all employee. What about motivation? Do employees feel any different? Will management have enough skin in the game? I think you need to value continued independence above all, because there's a real disincentive to sell, which may act as a poison pill and it can limit your strategic options. Right now, what about the practicality of doing them before the budget? Pretty much the same as a buyout, I think, but there is more to do here. So you need to crack on. There's a trust to set up, of course, and there's a significant amount of extra work for the lawyers in drafting the docs. Interesting, perhaps, to compare and contrast these two kinds of transactions. They both address succession and exit through employee participation, basically. And the key differences are tax. Employee trust is much better on the way in, but on later exit, the buyout is better. Senior team motivation, I think that's better on the buyout, skin in the game. Customization, slightly better on the buyout. Retention of culture, maybe controversial, but I think the buyout is a clear winner here because for most owner-managed businesses, a shift to this trust structure is quite a culture shift to become much more custodial. And what about motivation of people across the company? Well, I think to be honest and properly, that's about the same. So some practical tips then to get deals done quickly when the tax clock is ticking. Four of them. Number one, don't just move the deck chairs. You have to be ready for real change. To make these deals work for tax, you have to sell more than half the company to an employee trust and probably quite a bit more than that to make a buyout work. So you need to build this on a solid commercial rationale. Number two, be realistic. You want to get a deal done quickly. Try to be fair about the valuation and don't overcomplicate things. Number three, don't be greedy. Don't burden the company. Base this whole thing on realistic forecasts. And number four, be flexible. We're seeing a lot of flexibility in deal structures right now to address all the uncertainty. So things like cash sweeps, use of preferred ordinaries, and different approaches to vendor debt. So pulling it all together then, what are the chances of doing a deal pre-budget and beating Rishi to the finish line? Well, I hope you can see there are lots of real options for you and if you're an advisor for your clients. Ned has covered off the market where there's plenty of liquidity driving deals, a wide range of funders who are active and strategic buyers have, have real appetite. Phil talked about the kind of sales that you can practically achieve, focusing on accelerated m &A and negotiated sale. Jan has gone through some of the tax issues that we all need to think about. And I've touched on what I think are probably the two front runners time-wise, which is buyouts and employee trusts. I began by reminiscing about the Wilkinson Air deal done at speed before the last tax cliffhanger, and I promised you another parallel. Well, that time around, Alistair Darling uh, took away with one hand and gave with the other the entrepreneur's relief that we've all come to love. Well, my money's on a similar concession this time around, and Jan's touched on this. The tax review that is driving the fear of the CGT hike, well, the same report proposed introducing a retirement relief for business owners who've held a large chunk of their company for a long time and possibly age-related. So finally, I'll leave you with three reasons to be cheerful. Number one, the market remains buoyant. Number two, deals can be done to this time scale. And number three, don't quote me on this, but I think we'll probably have some new retirement relief to work with post the 5th of April. So I'm going to hand back to Sean now to uh, mastermind the Q&A. Thanks, Lake. Uh, thanks for those interesting presentations, everyone. Um, so we move to the Q&A now. Um, we've received a number of questions, so I will pose the first one to Philip. Um, and the question is, uh, when's the best time to engage lawyers on a sale process? Cool, thanks, Sean. I had a quick look through um, the attendees 
and we've got uh, a few lawyers who are logged in, so I'm going to be very kind to you. Um, I think I think the best time to engage a lawyer, particularly when time is of the essence, is, is probably right right at the sharp end of the deal. You, you want to make sure that all the all the headline commercial terms have been agreed, um, and you've at least got the deal to um, the, to, to heads of terms, the heads of agreement, where both buy side and sell side understand what the key levers are. But where it starts to drift into specific definitions, um, requirement for warranties and indemnities um, and disclosure and all that kind of stuff, that, that's when you definitely want um, a decent commercial lawyer, a corporate lawyer uh, engaged. But, 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 you know, because time is of the essence, you want to make sure that you've got the right price, you've got the right process, Everything's been agreed, and then at that point, you get the corporate money. Thank you. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is uh, one for Ned. Um, you talked about uh, vendor loan notes uh, in your presentation. Um, in layman's, layman's terms, what does this mean? Yeah, good question, actually. Um, <clears throat> a really, really popular um, way of funding, especially buyouts and uh, OBTs, I later talked about. A vendor loaner is essentially uh, an IOU. It's issued by, um, well, it's given to the exiting shareholders, and it's basically a debt instrument that sits on the balance sheet and is paid by the new company, the acquiring company, out of the cash flows of the company. So it can be spread over a long period, and it's quite flexible. And I suppose the real benefit of that is quite friendly debt. It's uh, issued by the exiting shareholders who normally have a retained stake in the company going forward and uh, is normally issued at quite a, a low coupon rate. So we're sort of seeing interest rates of about 1% on vendor loan notes. Thank you. Uh, another question here. It's directed at Jan. Um, so when considering, there's quite a long question that try and if you can try and compute it. So when considering equalizing CGT with income tax, the government will differentiate between CGT on genuine enterprise and entrepreneurship um, risk plus positive contribution to the economy through growth and jobs. And then CGT on second home ownership, um, carried interests, et cetera. Um, what, what's your, your, your comment on that? I agree. I think there's been a lot more focus in terms of um, you know, what assets people are holding. Um, I think I agree with what Lake said that we are going to expect some kind of retirement relief or business asset disposal relief for some time. I think also, um, I think, is it in the interest to, to, to be a bit too harsh? I don't think so, because um, that's going to slow down some of the transactions. So I think there's probably going to be quite a lot of the rumour mill going on for some time, but I expect that the changes will, will take a number of years, but we've already seen an 8% increase on residential properties. We've seen an attack on you know uh, residential property being held by non-residents. Um, you know, there are also other things um, I would really suggest if people have the time uh, to look at the OTS, certainly the executive summary it is a 135 page document. I mean, as a tax person, that's the kind of stuff I like to read, but I'm not sure everyone else would, uh, would uh, delve into to the detail. But I think there are things about family investment companies in there being scrutinized uh, and you know, looking at investment activities. So I think those are the areas that are going to be targeted with, with higher rates of uh, capital gains tax. And we'll have some form of relief for, for business owners, um, but I don't imagine it's going to be as generous or they might uh, request for people to have a much higher interest in the business to be able to qualify for those reliefs. Thanks, yeah. and, and following on onto that CGT theme, uh, Lake, uh, what, do you th what do you think um, changes to CGT uh, will, uh, how will that impact transactions after the budget? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Well, I think there's inevitably going to be a bulge pre-budget. That's why we're all here, isn't it? Um, and then there will be a recalibration of vendors' price expectations. Most business owners, I think, in, in our experience, when they talk about price, they have a net number in mind. So I, I think there's going to be a number of people probably delaying transactions and other people coming to market with a bit of a push for, for more cash. So um, 
I'd love to think that momentum carried on, but I think there will inevitably be a bit of a downward pressure on volume in the short term. Um, although hopefully we've got some other some other positives. But that was pretty much what happened the last time around. Obviously, circumstances were different, but the same kind of step change in tax produced an acceleration of deals and then a little bit of a hiatus afterwards. So it wouldn't be surprising if we saw that again. I think just to add, add to that, if I can, Sean, I think we'll also see a, a sort of a change in deal structuring. Um, if the valuation up front can't be met, there'll be a lot more earnouts. Um, you know, if, if the guys believe that they can hit those lofty heights where the valuation should be, there'll be a lot more earnouts. But also there'll be sort of things uh, along the lines of rolled equity, buying into the future, a lot more alignment with the buyer going forward. And that's how they'll sort of, sort of uh, reduce the difference in price expectations, I think. I think, can I also add in terms of setting up a business, there are various uh, venture capital schemes, uh, tax efficient investments, investments that can be made like CDI, CDIS, where if they are structured correctly, then um, on an exit, you, you do have capital gains tax exemptions and so on. So these are things that really when, when people are setting up a business, I know that probably for today's talk is, is we're talking about exits, but that's going to be a focus, I think, in the future, making sure that you set up the business correctly from the outset so that you can have your capital gains tax reliefs on the way out. And with tax legislation, if there's a change in one area, then typically people will look at other areas that they can uh, you know, benefit from, such as EOTs, uh, post budget as well. Thank you. Um, question for Phil. Um, and obviously, you know, you've, we've got time scales are, are tight if you want to do a quick deal quickly. But the question is, do you reckon it is better to first have clarity on why are we doing this deal rather than how do we do this deal? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's applicable to anything in life, really. Um, sit down, first of all, and, and ask yourself the question, why? You know, why are we looking to sell at this point? And I think I think the key the key theme that that's recurring wherever we're having conversations with our clients when it comes to exiting is you know it's either a retirement sale or you know there, there, there's a change in direction there's there's a, a change in direction in regards to life something something has happened um, which requires a, a different spend of time in terms of life they're all different manners um and all different factors and, and, and manner of ways of, of approaching you know, why you do a transaction the how to do it the structure and all of that is you know is definitely a key requirement for for consideration and, and, and thinking about in great detail and, and and it's good to have advisors alongside um, alongside you when you're coming to thinking about you know, how to do things I mean, we've, we've, we've stressed upon that today but definitely why is, is, is a key component for it um, and I guess um, as well without kind of drifting too far into a sort of philosophical way of, of, of thinking um, it's all about it's not sort of legacy in some cases. I mean, many of our clients are owner managers. They've started the business from scratch and they've grown it to the point it is um, at the time that they engage with us. And, 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 and the why is really key for some of our clients. You know, they, they, they want um, the legacy to, to, to continue. They want the name to remain above the door. They want a retention of culture and ethos and all of those types of things. But actually, it's just time to to, to, to cash their chips in, so to speak, and, and realise some value and, and go off and, and, and do other things. So, so yeah, absolutely, it's a really good question. Why is a key component before how, for sure, for sure. If I could just add a bit to that, I, I think most of the deals that are going to happen now will have, people will have been actively thinking about the strategy for, that, for quite a few months. Because in parallel with that, there is a whole community of people who, due to COVID, due to the tax changes, yeah, they're thinking about exits, but there's a bunch of people out there who probably recalibrated their timescale. We're having some interesting conversations with people about what's my two to three year strategy to exit when they might before have thought that it would have been about now. So probably divides the world into a couple of camps, but absolutely, you've got to start with commercial rationale. And the same goes for all these tax factors. Uh, best way of persuading the revenue to clear something is that it's got a blindingly sensible strategic foundation for what you're doing. 
So, uh, Lake, so a question to follow up on that then, is, um, is it possible then to do a buyout in a couple of months, <clears throat> in a couple of months without having warmed up the management team first? That's a really good question because um, obviously buyouts are about numbers and they're about tax, but actually the most important bit is the people. And if the buyout team aren't capable or up for it, then of course you can't do a deal. Um, yes is the short answer, but you need to be careful. Um, you obviously need to form a judgment that you have a team of people who are good enough and up for it and able to do it. And then I think it's a case of trying to be I mentioned earlier, don't be greedy, be fair. Uh, try and structure a deal that actually works for the seller, but also for the incoming team. And then I think the key is to think very carefully about how you communicate that. Don't communicate it until you're ready. I've seen disasters uh, emerge from leaks in these processes where management and vendors fell out. Wait till you're ready. You only get one chance to make a first impression and have a good cogent presentation, fairly open book as to how it's going to work. Should be a great deal for both sides. Um, so yes, but um, communication is everything and also trying to strike a deal that is genuinely fair to, to both sides, I think. Good. Um, I mean, this 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 question now obviously probably first directed at Ned. Uh, obviously, he's, he did some scene setting. Um, wouldn't most business owners be better at waiting to sell to a trade buyer later rather than sell at a discount now to an MBO team? Um, in short, it depends. Um, I think uh, there's two aspects, I suppose, to that. In terms of the MBO. That doesn't necessarily have to be a discount. Um, it may not be a strategic price, but um, the way it's structured helps with that, especially using vendor loan notes. Um, your vendor loan notes can be paid over a period of time. And because um, they're quite cheap in terms of their interest rates, it's, um, that can be quite high capital value. Um, the other aspect of that is that within the MBO, you can uh, retain a stake, and that can be sort of up to 25%. So really that helps boost the valuation as well. Um, selling to trade, yes, absolutely. But I think what we're talking about here in this webinar is about the timescales. And actually, post-budget, which we don't know what's going to happen, um, the net number you get in terms of consideration may be lower on the trade sale. So again, it's all about sort of timing and thinking about your options. All right, great, thank you. Um, now's probably with the time at uh, 5 to 12. Um, now's a good time to um, bring these uh, the session to a close. Um, so obviously, thank you um, to all our presenters um, for answering those questions. Um, um, if you um, have a question post events, um, please feel free to get in touch. I mean, I'll be circulating these contact details around um, after the event, uh, as well as Ned's. Um, so please um, get in touch. Um, I hope you found the, um, the, the session interesting. Um, thank you for attendance and uh, wish you goodbye and good day. <laughs>